my name is uh, John Miko, and I flew in for this talk uh, from San Francisco from the Mountain View office, and uh, never been to New York before. So unlike Ari, I have um, not don't have to work for material because New York provided it for me. Um, I was coming from the airport in the shuttle, and there were five people on the shuttle, and I was the last stop. Of course, I'm going to be the last one. And number four, the driver pulls up, and he said, 112th Street. The guy looks at him, he goes, I don't live here. The driver goes, this is where you told me you go. <laughs> and they spent 10 minutes arguing. And the guy's where he actually lived was like two blocks that way. I was like, wow, welcome to New York. So I learned a little bit about New York. Um, maybe I'll be back. I don't know. Um, OK. They really do mean it when they say that you know people aren't exactly friendly here to each other. OK. <laughs> I just thought they. They both survived, and yeah, no. We were both stupid. <laughs> yeah, that was the problem. Maybe that was, was a bad example. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about the size of the system that we are working on that we have to test every day. Um, we have about fifteen thousand developers in about forty different offices. They're pretty much all submitting to exactly one branch. Now, the the projects. All of the Google projects that you know and love out there, only the ones that are open sourced, like Android and Chrome, and maybe some of them are open sourced that I don't mention, those don't use this particular integration system. They stay with the open source tooling. But everybody else, all the other products, are using this system for integration testing. So um, we have about 4,000, more than 4,000 active projects, about 5,500 submissions per day on the average. Um, and again, I already talked about it all being on one branch, and all submissions are at head. And we build everything from source. There's no uh, you know, partial builds or prepackaged anything. Every, every build goes all the way to the bottom of the source tree and builds it. Um, we have during you know, 20 plus uh, CLs per minute and with peaks that are over 60 CLs per minute. So about one a second coming into the main repository uh, during peak times. 50% um, of our code files change every month, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And we run over 75 million test cases per day. So that's just kind of a little bit of an idea of the problem that we're facing. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit how that works, how continuous integration systems normally work, uh, and how the one at Google works that's a little bit different. So um, first of all, let's talk, take a side trip a little bit. What, what is a continuous integration system supposed to do? Well, two uh, main functions that it does, right? One is to provide real time information to build monitors. When you have only one branch, when there's a build break, you want to know as fast as possible and as accurately as possible. So you want to be able to say, this guy broke the build with this CL. right? And at some companies with a regular traditional build, which I'll go into in a second, if several CLs are being tested together, how do you know which one broke the build? And that becomes a, either a tribal knowledge or something. You have to have somebody smart there to figure it out. Um, so you also need to be able to handle flaky tests, tests that uh, I'm going to take questions at the end. Thank you. So yeah, you have to be able to handle flaky tests when they happen, because it's just a fact of life that sometimes tests are going to fail when they're not really failing. Um, oh, a CL. I'm sorry. CL. Sorry. Change list. It's a single set of files being submitted together by one developer. I'm using slang. I apologize. Um, I'll try not to do that, but, but CL is one that just is going to keep coming out. Um, so. Then there's a second function for release engineers. They want to be able to take a green build, a build that's been tested, and they want to be able to ship it. They want to put it on the web. They want to do whatever with it. So they need to be able to identify a recently green build. Um, they need to show all the testing that ran against that particular uh, change to make sure it's good and make sure all the tests pass and all that. Um, they also want the tooling to automatically select one of those green uh, builds and use it. Uh, and again, they have to handle the flaky uh, test because if a test fails at a particular uh, CL, I'm going to keep using that. I, hopefully, it'll be okay. Um, if it fails at a particular CL and it didn't actually fail, then they need to know that so they can rerun it and get a passing result. So. And finally, the last function is you want your developers to be able to develop safely. In other words, you want them to know ahead of time if they're going to break the build. So you want to be able to sync to the last green change list, the one that was green before. You want to identify whether the change you're just about to make is going to break the build. right? You want to do that reliably. And then you want to be able to submit and say, yeah, I didn't break the build, and know that you didn't. And again, they have to handle flaky tests too, because for them to be able to say, I'm going to submit it if a test 
fails and it's not really failing, they can't submit. So they want to be able to know about those flaky tests. So how does a standard continuous build system work? Here's a nice little diagram. Okay. So the changes come in, the first change, the second change, the third change. Okay. And the standard continuous build basically runs in a loop. It starts, it runs all the tests. When it's finished, it says, aha, it's either passed or failed. And then it runs all the tests again. It syncs to the new head. So in this trivial example, you have three changes. The first one gets tested. Okay, and if it broke the build, you'd be able to tell that it did. Maybe it's the only one that's included. But then change two and change three come in, and they get tested together. And now you have a break of test one. How do you know which CL, change two or change three, broke that particular uh, test? And the answer is you don't, unless you're smart. Unless you have somebody who's really good at isolating what the fault is, or you have tribal knowledge that, oh, if this breaks, Joe's, Joe's submission must be the one. So, um, so what the Google Continuous Build System does instead is... We start testing simultaneously every CL that comes in at the second it's submitted. We monitor the source control system. As soon as that change is submitted, we pick it up and we start testing it immediately, or as fast as we possibly can. And we test all the different CLs con uh, concurrently. So change one comes in, we start testing it. Change two comes in, even though change one isn't done, we start testing that one. And then change three comes in and we start testing that one. So we can tell that when test one breaks, change two broke it. Not change two or three, but change two. Precisely that change is the one that broke it. Um, that has a big advantage because it makes the build monitor's job really easy. This, this change, it broke this thing. And you know you can go to somebody and say, hey, with confidence, you broke it. You have to, you have to uh, roll it back or fix it. Um, now you notice here that we didn't run test two at change two, and we didn't run test one at change three. You might ask why we didn't do that. Well, our uh, testing system uses the fine-grained dependencies. You may have been here for a previous talk by Michael Barnathan about the build system. It uses the dependency tree that's in the build system to figure out which test to trigger. So it only triggers tests that depend on the code that changes. This is really important for Google because if you can imagine some of the Leaf projects, say Google+, Plus, they don't want to be running the tests for uh, ads, some ads project when they submit. They only want to run the test for Google+. Plus. So only those things that are affected by their change are going to get tested. Um, and only if you have a change like in the core library somewhere, those poor guys are always in trouble. But if, if, if you have a change in the core library somewhere, then you could break a lot of things. And then a lot of tests have to run. But normally, the normal submissions only have to run the tests from the area where the code is being submitted. And uh, So here's a display. It's kind of weird. Um, and I have to gray out the names of the tests. My VP said, no, you can't see that. Um, so. What this is is a bunch of names of tests over here. And we did something funny. We made the time go in the reverse order. So the older, older changes are over there, and the newer changes are over here. And you can see the little green checks are, hey, the test passed. And across the top, you have all your change lists going. These are older towards newer. Um, and you can see this test was green, 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 green. Oh, which one broke it? This guy. And so you call the author of that change and you say, hey, your, test, your change broke the build. And they have to roll it back. Now, or they have to fix it. And we have an automated rollback. So if you have, submit a CL that's going to break the build and it breaks it, you can roll it back, take it back, and it'll negate the change and keep going. Now, sometimes, and we, and we allow people to make a quick fix, but if it's going to be like, hmm, I don't know why that, you know, then we roll it back and you'll re resubmit the change after you figure out why that particular test broke. Now, you can see this lovely little red scattered through here. Um, you can imagine what that might be. Those are all um, flaky tests. And they're tests that are failing, but it's not hermetic. When we say hermetic, it just means that it doesn't only depend on the code that was being submitted. It depends on some other variable that's not related to the code. And this code is perfectly fine, or by some definition, perfectly fine. It might not be. It might have, might have flaky uh, problems in the code under test, as well as flaky test issues. This test is, is not showing you a real failure. And that's a real problem for us at the scale we're running. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that problem later. So what are the benefits of this uh, integration system that we have? Um, it lets you identify the failure sooner. Because it picks up the change as soon as you submit it. It tests every change so that by itself so that I can immediately tell who broke the build. Okay. 
And it avoids this sort of divide and conquer or tribal knowledge. You know, the 20 CLs that are getting baked together, which one broke the build? And that's always a problem to figure out. And the more changes that are in it and the more complex changes that are in it, it's hard, harder to do it. Um, the use of the fine-grained dependencies help to reduce the computing cost because we only test the things that are dependent on the code that changed. Um, it helps to keep the, the build green by reducing the time to fix breaks because you're going to find out as soon as you possibly can that you broke it. Now, Google has a lot of tests, hundreds of thousands of tests, and some of them take a long time to run. We actually put a time limit on them. We tell them, no, you, you can't take more than 15 minutes for the test to run, and we can retry it a couple of times. There's all overhead. And, but we guarantee that after you submit a change, that you'll have a result, pass or fail, within 90 minutes of a, of a change going into the system. And we're stacking them up. So all the changes that are coming in, the many a minute, are all being stacked up. And none of them are more than 90 minutes behind the head. OK? Um, this has been accepted enthusiastically by our product teams. They love it. OK? They're addicted to it. When we try and take it away, they're like, no, you can't. We need it. Um, it enables the teams to ship with amazingly fast iteration time. There's teams in Google, Google Plus is one of them, that developer submits a change. It's live on the web within 36 hours of them submitting a change. And it's all part of this continuous integration. And there's other kinds of testing that they do, but they have a, a pump. And they're shipping releases out onto the web every 36 hours of that product. Now, some of the other products are a little bit behind in that. They're not shipping quite so often. But all of the Google products collectively are moving in that very fast direction. We want to be able to take developer code and get it out to our customers as fast as we can. So well, now here's the costs. Well, gee, it requires an enormous, I'm using the word enormous. I wasn't allowed to put a number there, but it's enormous. Investment in compute resources. Um, it does help a little bit to be Google. We have a lot of computers. Um, <laughs> and it grows in proportion to how fast developers submit. We hire developers. What is the first thing they want to do? They want to write code. OK? Um, the test time, the average test time is growing. The different variants that people want to do is growing. I want a debug build and an optimized build. And I want to use Valgrind. And I want to use all these other tools that take compute resources. When you run Valgrind on an application, it runs about 10 times slower than it does without Valgrind. And that means that the duty cycle on those computers that are sitting out there take 10 times longer on those as well. Um, and branches. Sadly, I told a little lie. We actually have two branches of main development, one for the very corest of the core, because we found that the overhead of those guys submitting the corest of the core stuff is too high on our compute system. So we actually have two. Um, so it's not quite true that it's only one. Um, but we, we release the corest of the core stuff four times a day onto the main branch, and it just goes and runs all of the you know, 500,000 tests that it's going to trigger when it runs. And it, the other thing that might not occur to people right away is that the dependency map is constantly changing. So before we can tell what tests are, run, are to run on a given change, we have to recompute that dependency map. So we have a live dependency map. It's in memory. And every ch time there's a change, we rebuild that map before we ask the question, what test should I run? Okay? And that takes time. So after the change is submitted, we pick it up and we run the dependency update part of the system, and then we say, OK, what, what test should we run? And then we start you know, doling them out. So um, let's see. OK. Now I want to switch gears a little, talk about the other half of the system is for pre-submit. If you're going to keep the build green, you need the developers to be able to test. In our experience, the best way for them to do that is to be able to do exactly the same thing that we're going to do with their change after they submit it then we can make a good prediction of, yeah, this is OK. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass. So um, it may, we made this testing system completely available before submit. Okay? It uses the same fine-grained dependency mechanism. And it recalculates any dependency changes that you made in your workspace. So if you go and change the build files and you change the dependencies, you add a new file that needs to be compiled, whatever it is, we keep track of those new dependencies. Um, we use the same pool of computing resources that we use for the, for the changes after submission. Um, but we give a higher priority to pre-submit because some developers are waiting. We want to get their CL into the build. We can't wait for them. So we allow them to use the same compute resource and we give it higher priority. Um, this avoids build breaks. 
basically, because we let the developers, and in fact, some teams, many teams, have instituted a practice where they are not allowed to submit until tap pre-submit. The pre-submit tool says, yeah, it's good. Um, and it captures the content of their change and tests it in isolation against a known good starting result. So you got your starting position. You're going to make your change. You test it exactly the same way you would after submission. And you know you have good confidence that it's going to pass. And we always test against head. So even though your, your workspace might be a little behind, it can't be up to date because somebody just submitted something a second ago. Um, we, we test it against head at the time when you start. Um, and this identifies problems. This tool identifies problems with missing files. Because when you're on your workspace, you do a pre-submit run, we have to capture the workspace content and ship it off to our servers to be able to run the build. Okay, And we capture it right at the beginning. Any changes they make don't show up in the test results. It's kind of a mixed, a double-edged sword because they could actually break something after starting the pre-submit run. But if they forgot to put a file in the change list and it's in their workspace, guess what? <laughs> it won't pass because we only captured what was in the change and not what was in their workspace or their file system. So it's completely divorced from the file system that the developer has. And I can't tell you how many problems that just avoids because <laughs> people are always forgetting to add new files or they're forgetting to you know, put the files together into the change. Um, it integrates with the submission tool. There's a way to say, pre-submit my, my change. And if it passes, go ahead and submit it. And it, so it's sort of integrated in that way. It's also integrated with the code review tool. We have a very strong code review uh, policy here at Google. Everybody reviews, peer reviews their code. Um, and this pre-submit will actually put the results onto the code review thread so everybody who is looking at that code can see the results of testing it. So it's pretty cool. But if we're going to have all these people submitting on one branch, we've got to have it. So um, this is an example result from the pre-submit tool. Oh, my VP missed the names. Oh, oh that's OK. Um, <laughs> so here's the pre-submit tool. Um, you can see it groups things for you. It tries to help you to point to what might be a problem here. So um, we skip 223 tests. Skip tests are tests that are like too big. If they take too long to run or if they're marked local, which they can only be run in, a, in the corpse side, they get skipped. They go here. Um, still passing. We ran 1,366 tests on this particular change, and all of them were passing before and passing after the change. That's a good sign. Um, one test is newly passing. Hey, maybe they fixed something with this change. That's a good thing. Um, and one test was newly failing, and this little mark means it's a timeout. Um, it's probably likely that that's a flate. Okay? Um, and then one test is still running on that particular uh, change. And when it's done, you'll get the final result. So this is just the UI that the developers see when they say, OK, I'm done pre-submitting my change. What happened? Oh, well, yeah, mostly you can ignore it. You fixed one thing, and maybe you broke something. Maybe you need to look at that. So um, here's just a little overview of the system architecture, sort of how it works, how it's put together. Okay, We have this dependency service that constantly is monitoring for change lists that are coming into the system and updating that dependency graph so that it's up to date. And it, actually, it can actually take a parameter of what change list you want the dependency graph for, and it rolls it forwards and backwards. One of my engineers wants to do a multi, you know, so you can have like many versions of the tree in memory at the same time, but we haven't gotten that fancy. You just have one version of the tree, and we know how to roll it forwards and backwards by applying the changes forwards and backwards. So we analyze each change and we figure out sort of the, the content of the change and we write a little packet that says here, if you have to apply this change or take it away, here's what changes you need to make. It's like a patch, a patch to the dependency graph. And we store those and we can roll forward and backwards on them. And then the change lists at the same time are going into a different server that's supposed to find the affected test for this particular change. Um, so it'll go through and ask the dependency server, hey, what tests were affected? And if the dependency server isn't done updating the graph, it'll say, wait, 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 wait a minute. It'll hold it, make it wait. It'll pause until it gets the answer. And one of the other things is um, we allow a concept of projects that group a bunch of tests together that are relevant for a particular team, like the Google Plus team or the Ads team. They, they all have uh, their projects that define what tests they're going to run and what tests are relevant to them, what tests they care about not breaking. For those things, they're allowed to associate flags with them that are for different variants. We want a debug build of that, and we want an optimized build of this, and we want a Valgrind build of that. 
all those project flags can mean that you take the effective test, the test you know you want to run, and now you multiply it by every project that has that test listed in it and its project settings. So if, if one is optimized and one is debug and one is valgrind, one test might get three things that you need to execute. The debug version, the optimized version, and the valgrind version all have to run. So even though you know here you might have some number of tests, this is going to basically multiply. It's a cross product of this. Um, Another thing that happens because as a consequence of this, these project, this project concept, is these projects have patterns in them that say, every test under this directory, that's what I want to run as part of my project. Okay? And so we have to update those maps as well because you add a new test to a particular directory and it's going to show up in somebody's test list because we, and we have to know that because it's part of the pattern. It matches the pattern that they said everything in this directory should be tested as part of my project. So we're, we're updating those at every CL as well. Okay, and then we put them into a big queue of tests that are waiting to run, and then we ship them off to the build system, which is what Michael Barnathan talked about the last time. It, the, the test system is the biggest consumer of the build system because all of our uh, test actions execute on their, build, on their compute farm. So we send them all the tests and we say, go run them. We monitor, we make sure it's working, and then eventually we get back results. There's a pub sub that gives, you, gives us the results, and we get the pass fail, and we put it into the database, and we just play the nice little picture about what happened. Pass, this thing worked, it didn't work, it failed, it didn't fail, all that good stuff. So, just a quick, you know, high-level view of kind of how the system is put together. Um, so, well, now I'm gonna talk about flaky tests. I know I mentioned them a few times along the way. Um, some people call them sporadic, but they're just a test. Basically, the system assumes, it assumes this kind of a system that tests pass or fail reliably given the code, that the only input that decides whether the test passes or fails is the code. If that's the way it was, my job would be a lot easier, okay? It would be a lot easier. Unfortunately, a lot of tests don't have that property and they're called flaky, flaky tests. Um, and I've been at several companies working on build systems, Google's my third. Um, and they're just a fact of life. A certain amount of flaky tests is a fact of life because the, the test could have races in it. There's all kinds of reasons. I have all the, the reasons here. The machines could fail, the environment, you know, different tests could impact each other. We, we found some tests that fail when the resources get overloaded, they like time out because when you're running 10 builds on one machine and, and they're all like, you're running the worst case test on every one of those 10 things that you're running on that one machine, you can crunch it and then the test might start timing out because they just because they take longer. Um, and if you're right near the edge of a timeout, you might get a timeout, those sorts of things. So we've, we've, we've tried to, to work with this. I'll talk about it a little bit on the next, next slide. But there are all kinds of reasons why these tests can be flaky, and they're not all possible to be fixed, and certainly not all possible to be fixed at one time. Because what did I say about one, one change a minute, one change a second in the peak, right? So. The, the rate at which new flaky things are being introduced, you have to, and it, they're hard to fix. So the rate they're taken out, you know, it's kind of hard to get to a state where there, there aren't any. Um, and not to mention the, all the other reasons, the infrastructure and all that that can cause problems. So she's laughing. It's true. <laughs> okay. So again, um, having these flaky tests means that you really can't find changes that are breaking the build reliably anymore. All of a sudden, you got the, like I showed you in that other picture, where there's those nice little red spots that are showing everywhere. Um, actually, that project that I showed you up uh, with the red spots, they're actually, they actually de declared a sort of mini code yellow. It's a Google term for sort of a problem. They're having a problem with flaky tests. And they're, as a team, they're all trying to attack their particular project and making sure that the flaky tests in that project are, are eliminated or fixed. Um, it's an and you also have trouble uh, finding green builds for the releases because if you have these flaky tests showing up, it makes it you don't get a green result, and then how can you release because you don't know whether it's right or not. Um, it could be a real failure that only failed at one CL and maybe got fixed in the next one, but likely it's not. Um, it wastes work for the build monitors because you're monitoring the build. You see that, oh, it's failed. Now you have to go bug somebody, or do you? Um, you go bug the developer, oh yeah, I know about that, it's flaky. You know, okay. Um, wasted compute resources, and we're wasting tons of resources running tests that are 
sometimes not producing a good signal for us. Um, and inappropriately failing pre-submits. This is probably the biggest one, right? If we tell people you can't submit until you get a green, and sometimes they can't get one easily, it means they're wasting their time. They're, they're having to run the test a few times or rerun the test, um, and it wastes their time. And that's, and that's the developer time is at a premium, right? That's, that's the most, that's the thing you want to optimize for almost, even more so than the computers. Um, solutions to this problem. We do all of them. We fix them. It's hard. It requires developer time. If I go to the, some fast paced group like Google Plus and I say, hey, I want you to spend time fixing your tests instead of writing new features for your customers. Their VP is going to look at me and say, what? Buy more machines, deflake them. I don't want to know. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, that developer time is really hard to get, especially when they're, you're competing with the re same resources that are going to have to build the next version of their tool that customers are using and that we're making money with. I mean, it's, it's a hard sell. And in some cases, it's not the right choice. There are some flaky tests that are, you know, infrequently flaky and that are hard, really hard to figure out what's going on that it might be better not to fix because the developer time involved might be more expensive than, than the, just running them again. Um, hiding them, we, we, can, we have a system for retrying flaky tests when they happen. So you just, we have this thing, you mark the test flaky in the build file and it'll run it three times. Oh, first time failed, okay, run it again. Okay, and if it ever passes, it says, yeah, that's good. <laughs> we think. Um, we're trying to identify infrastructure flakes. So we're trying, to, we're trying to eliminate all the sources of flakiness that are coming from our system, because they do come from there. Overloaded machines and, and different reasons why the infrastructure can show up and, and cause flakes, and we're trying to get rid of those, or at least report them, right? Say, hey, look, we know we flaked. Sorry. Um, and we're trying to use metrics. We collect metrics about which t exact test runs were flaky tests, because at night when we have a few spare computers, um, at night we go and we Every failure that occurred during the day, we rerun it to try at that same exact change to figure out whether it was real or not. And we mark them after the fact, saying, yeah, that was flaky. Yeah, that was flaky. No, no, that one wasn't flaky. So we can actually discern. And then when we see a test that's flaky a lot, now we know, oh, yeah, when this one fails, maybe it's not really a real problem. And we give that, those statistics back to the users um, so that they can use their judgment and say, yeah, that test, yeah, it's probably flaky. Um, and we track them and provide the metrics, as I just said. So I got to display on the next slide here that talks about, um, again, the gray box. Um, so here's a list of tests over here. And over here, it's telling you how flaky these tests were. And the percentages might be a little misleading. This percentage, huh? Yeah. Well, the percentage flaky might be a little misleading. That's a percentage of the number of times this test failed. How many times was it a legitimate failure that was caused by a breaking change? And how many times was it a failure that was just flaky? So it's 100% flaky if every time it failed, it, um, it was a flaky failure and not a real failure. So like you see that second one there, it says of one recent fail. This is a, over an entire month. So in an entire month, that t test failed exactly once. And it was a flaky fail the one time it did. So it's not as bad as it might seem from the 100%. In fact, people have said maybe we shouldn't do that metric. We should try a different one. But that's the way, it's, that's the way it is now. Um, so you can see here, they have, you can see some of the more important ones, like here. This test failed 177 times. Um, this one failed 500, flaked 572 times in a month. Okay? So you can see that so, if, if you were a manager, a uh, testing manager, some of those, the one that flaked, you know, 572 times in a month, I might want to have somebody look at that one. I might get my develop, hey, go fix that. But the one that failed once in a month, I'm going to say, look. Cover that one over because I, you know, whatever that is, it's going to be hard, hard to figure out. So, again, it's just a matter of realism. It's realistic. You, you, you have this problem with these tests that that they don't always accurately reflect the state of the code. So, it's a pretty significant problem for us. Okay. Even Google can't buy enough computers. That's the, that's the next section. So. Um, the sources of growth in text execution time, as I said, more developers always come in. We're always hiring people. There's this thing inside Google called percent, and it's how many people in the company are, are you newer, are you senior to, basically, okay? And I've been here about a year, and I think my number is like I don't know, 85%. That means that 
that 15% of the Googlers that are here today are newer than me. And it used to grow a lot, maybe even for the size of the company, we're starting to slow down in terms of you know, the percentages, but it's still a lot. Um, anyway, so more tests. We tell people, write tests. We want you to write the tests. We want you to write the tests all the time, every day, write them. Um, longer running tests. Well, as the systems get bigger, the tests that test them get more complicated and they take longer to run. And the tests are very good now. You, run, you test a multi-threaded server, it can just blow out a machine. I mean, you can take the whole thing over. I mean, there isn't any question about that, right? So, you know, that, that's a really important problem too because the, the, the tests that you do have are requiring more compute resources. It's harder to predict how much compute resource they're going to take. Um, you want to give them as little as possible because you want to pack them into as many, a few computers as you can. But they're trying to take as much as they can get. We don't have, really have a good system for adjudicating that at this moment. And it's hard. It's a hard problem. So um, I did a little work to examine what the growth trends are for this to try and figure out, okay, well, how fast is it growing? How, much are, how many computers are we going to have to buy next year to keep up with this thing? Um, so, and also to look for any, any features that we might need to do to stay ahead of that. So here's a graph. The, the light blue underneath is the number, uh, the daily number of submissions um, for every day over the last year. How many submissions were made to the code base? Notice it's some, that's another thing my VP had me gray out was the, the units. So it's just to show you the trend. Um, and I think maybe the VPs shouldn't, don't tell them this, but you see this here? That's 4th of July and that's Christmas. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> and it's pretty much standard every year, 4th of July, Christmas. Uh, Google happens to give a long 4th of July holiday. So, you know, there's a big dip there and a big dip at Christmas. Um, but you can see we're linear in growing. Uh, you know, and it's gone up maybe 20, 30% in the last year. That's pretty good considering how many people we hired. Maybe it's almost close to the same number. I just said my percentage. Maybe it is the same number. I don't know. But so that's the growth in sales per day, and it's linear, thankfully. Right? It could be, could be nonlinear, at least as far as we can see from this here. The, oh, the black line is the 14-day rolling average, and the gold line is a linear fit to the, to the line. And this is the number of test seconds that we spend for every change that comes in. Okay, um, this line is also is, is more wavy, but it's actually less of a band, right? It's the blue, the blue underneath is the actual number on every day, and the black line is a two-week rolling average, and the gold line is linear fit. So the number of test seconds it was a little less than double. So we're spending twice as much to test a CL, a change. And the changes are coming in, say, 20 or 30 percent faster. So if you have two variables and and two factors, and you multiply them together, what kind of a curve are we going to get? Okay, that's exercise for the reader. See if you're awake still. It's a quadratic, and this blue line is uh, the total execution time in our execution system. The black line is the two-week rolling average, and the gold line is a uh, 2D polynomial fit to the rolling average, or yeah, to the to the data. So it's quadratic. So anything eventually, we're not going to be able to buy enough computers. That's the moral of that story. I mean, we're Google. We might go out there a ways, okay, but we'll hit the knee sooner or later, and we'll be screwed. <laughs> Need a bigger planet. Well, Moore's law helps, right? I mean. But it's not going to, even that, I don't think, I, I, Moore's Law is a way to tread water, you know, with this kind of a problem. So, um, but it isn't going to get you there either. Um, so the conclusions of that part are, you know, given that it's quadratic, again, ultimately we can't buy enough computers to run every test at every affected CL. We're very sad. Our customers are sad. We're sad. We'd like to be able to do it. We're going to our VPs and saying, gee, just keep doubling our resources and we'll be able to do it. And uh, they're already saying, what? OK, sorry. Um, in fact, we figured out at one point that if we wanted to double the resources here, we'd have to take every spare computer in every data center Google has. And that's when we got that look from our VP. So <laughs> you're going to do what? Oh, OK. Um, right now, we haven't done enough to provide incentive for teams to optimize their use of the shared resources for testing. So we have a number, we've hidden this all from them. From as far as the developers and development managers are concerned, you submit a CL and it tests it for you within 90 minutes. Ooh, 
We like that. But, you know, how, how heavy the tests are, whether the tests are adding enough value, whether they're, one of these things we, we've given for free, I don't know why we did it, I wasn't here then, but they, they came up with this system called sharding that allows a test to be divided into as many separate parts as you want up to 50. And each one gets its own execution engine, okay? And what happens when you divide the test up under more execution, it just takes less time to run. Oh yes, I can get my answer faster. Well, guess what? There's a lot of overhead built in to each text action, setting it up and uploading the data and doing all this wonderful stuff before you can actually run the test. And what we found is that as you go up with the number of shards, you get a tiny benefit, tiny benefit, like seconds on your execution time profile, but you double the number of resources that the system is using to run that test. And no one is looking at it because why? I mean, look, I had a developer the other day. Her test timed out. And her response was, oh, damn it. Double the number of shards. You know, <laughs> and that's exactly what she did. Because it doesn't matter to her. She doesn't care. Huh? Double the number of shards. Yeah. Oh, doesn't time out anymore. Happy. Um, but it costs twice as much compute resources to do that. So we're trying to provide incentives and, and try and show people their resource consumption. Um, so some of the things we're thinking about, um, and again, there comes, as I said before, even if you give them all the data and, and charge them with sort of monitoring their re resource profile, resource consumption, there comes a point where it doesn't make sense to do it because the engineering time investment would be too expensive and it's, it'd be better to buy the computer at some point. I'm not saying it's, it's the zero. Right now we have zero. It, it's some number bigger than zero and less than infinity. I don't know what it is, but it's somewhere. Um, so what we're talking about is enforcing perhaps execution quotas for teams. So a team would have so much budget to be able to run anything they want. They want to run Valgrind at 10 times the cost? Okay, fit it in your budget somehow. And the, the VPs can go in a room that I don't have to be in and they can argue about who gets more quota. Oh, it's Google Plus. No, it's ads. No, it's, oh, sorry. Um, you know, so <laughs> I don't have to care. They can come out with a number. You know, here, this guy gets 5% more than that guy. Happy, I'll do it. Good. I would definitely recommend that for other people who are in the build system. You know, just try and factor yourself out of those kinds of discussions. Okay. And then you have uh, smarter scheduling. So we're definitely figuring out that right now our scheduling engine is pretty stupid. Every effective test, run it. Pretty simple. We're going to have to have something smarter that's able to scale back the number of tests that are running to meet with the compute resource that we actually have. Okay. So you have this many computers, you can get them all busy, and then as soon as they're busy, you have a backlog. And now managing that backlog and doing it in a smart way is our next generation system that we're thinking about working on. It's an engineering problem. My engineers love it. They absolutely love it, right? It's like running water in a beaver. I mean, okay. So <laughs> I gotta keep myself from laughing. <laughs> Sorry. So we're thinking about smarter scheduling, um, the periodic green builds, so that every, we don't want to, so you will have to do some culprit finding in such a system because the, the compute resources just aren't there to run it at every CL. So you got to like space it out and get periodic greens and we'll be skipping over some CLs. We're going to try and minimize that. We'll use whatever available resource we have. We'll pin it down before we start cutting back, but we have to be able to cut back if we want to keep up with head and guarantee the 90 minutes. The other option we could have just said is, look, you'll get your results at night. You know, and a lot of the teams like, uh, the fast paced teams don't want that answer. They don't want to have to wait until night to get their answer from a CL they submitted at noon. They want that, that answer right away. And so we've decided for us that getting that answer more quickly means that we're not going to have exactly precise culprit finding. And we'll have to implement some kind of wonderful algorithm that when there is a transition edge can go back and do the culprit finding and figure out that's the CL that broke it. Again, a wonderful engineering problem. And the last one is the flake hiding, being able to use resources to be able to hide those flakes because they're going to happen and you have to sort of paper them over to get accurate results for people for the releasing and for all that stuff. So, all right. I hope nobody fell asleep. <laughs> I made that one New York comment and she's going to hold it to me. Okay. Um, I put some links here for uh, other resources, more information about uh, some of the stuff that's already been put out publicly, the different presentations and talks. Um, you can go look at those. Um, and I guess now we're ready for questions, are we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, 
<laughs> oh, is that on? No. Is there a switch on it? There. There, now try it. Yeah. No? Uh oh. Try again. And again. Ah, oh, there it is. There good. We go. We're good. So you mentioned earlier with regards to pre-commit that uh, certain teams were mandating that that be run before any change. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you can elaborate on as for why that's not becoming the standard? Um, I think it's the culture at Google to have very highly autonomous teams. And teams make a lot of their own decisions locally that are right for them. And what's right for a team that's trying to ship every hour or every four hours or every 36 hours is not the same answer for a team that might only be shipping once a month. We have teams who routinely break the build and leave it broken for a while because it's not so, that they're placing a premium on getting that new release next month or next week or two weeks from now instead of every few hours. And for those teams, uh, you know, they can make a trade-off. I mean, we encourage people to run them, but the highly autonomous team model really just sort of, it's a Google cultural thing. I've only been here a year, but I can tell you for sure, we don't want to tell teams what to do for the most part. As much as we could possibly do it, we just stay out of the way and give advice. You will have to stop really quickly and start telling you. At Google, yeah. If you're trying to tell them what to do, you have to duck. I've tried to tell, I had to tell them that they weren't going to get every test at every CL, and that was a very unpopular message, and people came and like beat the crap out of me. So yeah, they don't, they don't like to hear bad news or be told that they have to do something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. I, I would like to know what type, what are the types of tests that you do? Do you do load tests? Uh, stress test and base your... That's a, good, that's a good question. In this system, we limit any test to 15 minutes. And we constrain it so that you should not be talking... It's not strictly enforced, and maybe it should be. Should not be talking to any production infrastructure because that's something that can cause test flakes, right? If you're talking to some server that's up in Google somewhere, and that server goes down for maintenance or gets updated or whatever, your test starts failing. So. We, this system is not designed for, mostly not designed for load testing or stress testing because those typically take longer than what you're going to be able to do in 15 minutes. Some tests, some teams are trying to squeeze some of those tests in, and that's good. And we have a separate system for integration tests called Guitar that's meant for longer running tests or tests that are more complex or tests that have to bring up servers in production. So um, do you have to pass those tests before you release to production? So again, as I said in the talk, the this test is a quick test at every change list, and then we have the integration test take longer. And most teams, again, we don't dictate or mandate anything. Most teams require that both the te integration tests, the longer running integration tests, and the quick running tap tests are all green before they submit, before they you know push out a change. Uh, one more question: Do you have uh, how do you handle schema changes, data database changes? How do you handle that? Ah, as I said, most of this. The testing in here is very fast uh, unit testing and limited to 15 minutes in duration. And all the testing we have starts with, you know, you can give it canned data, but there aren't any real servers involved. And so if a schema change happens, you have to submit. If anything needs to be submitted, you submit all the schema changes, and then you build either an in-memory database mock or a real database using the schema on the fly, on demand for that particular test. And if it's too big to do that with, it's excluded from our system, and you have to run it on this other integration testing system framework that we use. Huh? Guitar. Yeah. Actually, we have two of them. One's called guitar, and one's called sitar. I don't know why it's this musical instrument thing, but that's what it is. Can you talk on that? Well, I can't give a talk on that because I'm not the dude who does that. But I can get you the dude who does. Maybe Ari can talk uh, Kurt into coming out here. It, it could be a good part of the series. In fact, you should. I was going to add a slide from, from Kurt from the guitar system in here, a, slide, a couple of slides. But since I'm not the guy, you might ask me questions. I wouldn't know. So. so. And how many testing environments do you have that are distinct or gates that are, you know, you have to pass CI tests, you have to pass functional tests, you have to pass load tests. How many of these do you have? Well, again, I can't answer that in the general case. We provide, and this is, again, the way we do it at Google, we provide all the frameworks and systems for this. And it's up to teams to pick and choose from the palette which systems are going to work for them and which gates they want to have in front of their submission. So I can tell you for particular teams, um, you know, I can tell you a little bit, but it, it, it varies. Some teams say, yes, everything. It's got to be the TAF build. It's got to be this. We even have some manual testers still. I think they're in India somewhere. 
but they come and they actually you know bring up the servers and they 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 try them out to make sure it works. So so yeah, teams have those guys in the loop too. Some teams do. So like the translation, for example, I think that's one of the teams because you translate something, no computer in the world is going to tell you whether it's right. They put people in front of it and they see is it right? Is it right? So Bob Gazelle here. We've got a scenario where you can break a build with a failed test, but that actually doesn't detect that the CL in question broke the build, but it detects that the CL detected the broken build. That's correct. So you could have a CL5 back that suddenly exposed a parameter, which this is the first test that happens to actually stumble on it. Well, that's It's the proverbial tree in the forest that crashes if nobody hears it. That's somewhat Did unlikely. Did it make a noise? That's somewhat unlikely um, because of the way we're using the fine grained dependencies. We know every file, source file that contributes to our build and to our test. And we put dependencies on the data dependencies on the, even the data files that are input to the test. So uh, it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard for a change to come in to something that doesn't trigger the right test for that. Um, we overrun tests. I mean, in the sense that we're conservative. Any thing that depends directly or indirectly through any chain on a file, when that file is submitted, it runs the tests that are relevant to it. So, well, well the, the case, the kinds of case I was thinking of was the core functionality with, say, an exception condition, say, a resource overflow. Mm -hmm. If that isn't part, isn't created and generated and forced as part of a pre-existing test, the first person to come around with a CL that actually uses the facility, oops. Yes. There's all kinds of defects that aren't tested for that can slip through, and, and they can be caught either by tests later or by real production code problems or any number of other things. We have a pretty strong regression testing feedback loop in most teams, you know, that, that when something breaks, they add a regression test for it, and hopefully it won't break again. Just want to make sure I understood the presentation correctly. No, no, it's good. <clears throat> And do you include any performance test to measure time if some, some, some functionality degrade performance? Again, this framework is not being used today for any performance testing. It's only for correctness. And the performance testing is either on the guitar framework or we have some ad hoc, uh, some teams have even developed performance tests as part of their own team infrastructure that you know we're sort of looking at and saying, yeah, do we want to pull that in or not, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I can actually make a suggestion. There are various engineers from Google who are here. For example, like I'm with the ads group, and I know somebody is here from the math group and stuff like that. If any of you have specific questions on how specific groups within Google use this tool, I'm happy to answer on behalf of my engineering group to the extent that I can and some of the other engineers and representatives. Yeah, it's harder for me to answer how anybody uses my tool because at Google, all I do is I put it out there. And people either use it or they don't. It's kind of the model of the way Google is. It's kind of googly. It's, I didn't know that was an adjective until I came here, but go ahead. Uh, when you run the tests, uh, how do you get the uh, results of the feedback back to you? Uh, do you only get it after all the tests are finished running, or if you get a failure early on in the tests, do you get notification immediately? Well, b believe it or not, um, the build system is fully integrated with the test system. Wow, isn't that an amazing thing? And they, we have a, a pub sub channel coming directly from the build when we invoke it. So the pub sub is streaming results to us as soon as they're found. A failing test or a failing build, we get that information instantaneously when it happens because we're right on the pub sub channel. It takes delivery time, but you know, it's like nothing in computers is really instantaneous. But you know, it takes delivery time. We get that right away. Now we do mark the test as failing immediately as soon as we get the result, incrementally as we go through the build. Um, but we don't compute the project status until we have all the tests that are included in that project. So. Uh, we roll them up into a green or a red for the project, and that only happens when all the tests for that project are done. But when you're doing the post-submit game, you have 20 projects that have all triggered tests for this particular CL. And if any of them are done, they get calculated and get a green or red the second all the tests for that particular project are done. So we try and stream it as fast as we can and be as close to the real bleeding edge as we can. So from an individual developer's point of view, the, the speed with which you can move is very much driven by that feedback. So I'm really concentrating here on the pre-submit. Yep, that's right. Um, so uh, you said that the, the quality service guarantees that you have at 90 minutes. Now, that's kind of long. That's for uh, post-submit. So, so what's, the, what's the sort of average pre-submit uh, feedback time? If something's failing, is it going to come back within a few seconds? Well, again, you're bounded in that case by the time it takes to run the longest test that you triggered. So, uh, so, so in the pre-submit case, you won't get any 
if you if you're failing a test, you won't learn about it until all the tests have run. No, you'll you'll learn about the individual test as soon as it finishes, but you won't get a complete picture of the change until you get the last test, which is the longest one. It'll take however long it takes. Typical times are in the 20 to 30 minute range for a pre-submit uh, for a large project. You know, and and developers complain about that, and I say, look, you know, it's your longest test that you're waiting for, not not my system. In fact, we have a guarantee of not only the end-to-end -end time, but we have a guarantee of overhead taken by our system. And on pre-submit, we guarantee that we're going to have less add less than two minutes of overhead to your pre-submit run. And that might seem like a lot, but it's necessary for all the functions that we're trying to do, computing the dependency grid and scheduling the test. So, but we in post-submit, we're allowed to have 15 minutes. So that shows you we're, we're really trying to put an emphasis on pre-submit, getting those results as fast as we can. Try to work constantly. Every quarter in my OKRs, which is Google speak for my objectives for the quarter, every quarter is decrease this latency by so much. And we're constantly trying to crank the latency down and tighten our response time so we can get quicker and quicker results to the users. One of the things we're focusing on now is changing the way we do flaky tests instead of doing them one after the other after the other, which means you have to run that long test three times if it flakes out. We're trying to do them simultaneously so we can run probabilistically. We know this test fails flakily 76% of the time, so we run three copies of the test at the same time. That means if any of them pass, we're happy, and we don't have to wait for the three in a row thing, which just drags out the test time. So, mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm curious, what is the rationale that you have only one branch? Um. <laughs> oh, no, no, oh, this is a wonderful philosophical question. I could spend a lot of time answering it, but let me give you my, my two cents, okay? Um, I worked at my previous company, they had 80 branches, okay? And that's how they chose to do it. This is the math works, they had 80 branches, okay? And a developer over here would submit a change, and it was a core change maybe, and it would take three weeks for it to integrate into the main line, and three weeks for it to come down onto a side branch. So if I'm a team that's a, that's a Leaf team trying to build a product with a core team that needs to deliver me a feature, okay, I have to wait six weeks to get that feature, and guess what? It always has a bug in it. Always. They didn't consider my use case properly. There's some weird thing. Maybe it passed all their unit tests, but when I go to actually use it in my app, I'm saying, wait, you look at, I need another parameter for this because I need to, you know, whatever. And then it takes another six weeks to get them the feature. The reason why Google chose the single branch, and I think it's a good choice, is they can put all their resources on testing the one branch instead of dividing the resources up between testing the many branches, and they can get the integration to happen like this. I have a guy who's delivering me a core feature so I can do my leaf thing. I get it as soon as he submits. As soon as he submits, I can sync and I can build with it. And that makes a huge difference for us. It allows us to, that it eliminates that integration delay. Also, the MathWorks had an army of release engineers managing the integration, constantly worrying about branch to branch merge and merge conflicts, and we don't have that. So, so I assume that this is one single target build, that you have a different target. Well, I remember build. I kind of lied. But different we have two device. <laughs> but, but, but for example, <laughs> if you build a Chrome browser, that you're, ah. you're going to test in different um, client platform, right? As I said in the beginning of the talk, the uh, open source projects are not using this build system. But like Google Plus and Google Web Search are both using this system. And when they submit things that are only related to them, it only affects their area. It doesn't trigger any other tests from other areas. So yeah, we're, we're taking advantage of that. But they all depend on the same core stuff, like the server code and all the other stuff that Google maintains. And that stuff is, could, could be changing. And they might need to rely on those changes. And we get them to them right away. So mm -hmm. well, I. I'd be surprised because I just went to lunch with those guys about a couple weeks ago. So, <laughs> okay, so I uh, have two questions. The first question is, uh, with so many submissions coming in, um, how do you, how do you compute the the dependency tree all the time? I suppose it's really expensive to compute that tree. Yes, it is. I mean, you had let's say you have two different submissions. How are you going to compute those two? And those two have okay. huge. So, so the way we do it right. is we do it sequentially in the order of submission of the changes, right? So there's a linear line of changes. They go one, two, three, four. We go along that line, always in exact sequence. We don't try and do out of order. Um, and we keep each one, we generate from the, that particular change a delta. And we look at the contents of the submission. A, a, a submission in this directory cannot affect the dependencies of a distant directory. So. We, we limit what we actually requery to 
hopefully a minimal set. Um, sometimes we have bugs in our algorithms that we get a bad patch and then a dependency can be wrong and we have to regenerate our tree from scratch. We have a utility function that goes and regenerates it. We open a bug, we fix the problem. So it's a tricky problem, but doing it sequentially and producing patches then allows us to roll the tree forward and backwards. We know how to apply those patches in either direction. So you can ask for any change list across the entire line and we can give it to you by rolling one, patching back and patching forward. That's, that's how we're doing it now. Um, it is very expensive to compute and hence the, the 15 minutes for post submit a lot of that time is taken up by this dependency calculation. Another part of it is taken up by the pattern matching when you say everything in this directory is, should be tested by this project. Um, both of those maps have to be kept up to date. Um, yeah, so by single threading it and doing the patching strategy that we have, it seems to be, we're able to keep up and also some smart strategies about exactly what we need to requery when something changes helps too. Um, the other question is, uh, I know that Google, uh, Google has many offices around the world on uh, world. Mm -hmm. uh, for this system, um, you probably use, do we have this, does this system only apply to one office at a no. part office or actually the entire? No, it's global. And, global. Okay. and I, I got to tell you, the only reason we're able to do it globally is because we have the best network in the world. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't think that's a secret, right? right. But okay. You, where do you sit down when you do Google web search where it's not fast? Okay. So, you know, okay. I, I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> I, I, we, uh, why don't we save it, um, these three individuals, the last, uh, last ones up with a formal question and answer, and then we have <laughs> um, okay. There's lots of people here from Google. I'm going to ask all the, the Google folks who um, are willing to answer questions to come up here, and then you know, uh, any of us are happy to answer. Mm -hmm. So I still have a question about the branching or the single or the two branches. Mm -hmm. How do you deal, for example, if you have a hot fix, you, let's say you release something to production, and you realize, oh, uh, there's a big problem now. I need to fix it, but now you have all these commits, and you, your, let's say your test fails now. Because it's a of great reason. question. It's a great question. So how do you handle that? Do I you lied branch? again. You lied again. The answer is I lied again. We also use branch. <laughs> See, you catch me all the time. It's not good. Do you branch in the code? We, when we make releases of each package, we branch the code for the release onto a release branch. Then we build from that branch. We branch from a known good CL. We build from that release branch the packages for the product. We ship them onto the web. And if there has to be a hot fix or a patch, it goes onto that patch branch that was created specifically for that release. We don't do a lot of testing on those branches. And in fact, it causes problems for us a little bit when you're, you're far along ahead and you have to do a hot fix. You might have to merge it into the patch branch, and you don't have good facility for testing there, and it's a problem. We don't we don't support really testing on those patch branches. Um, usually, what happens, being a web application is very easy, right? We don't have as much of that problem as some of the other companies. Like MathWorks has a huge problem with that, but Google doesn't because most of the time when it gets to those hairy merges, we just move forward, move the whole to take a new cut at a different CL, get all the changes that were rolled in, and, and release again. Uh, so generally, in, if it's been long enough, we don't do hot fixes. We just do a new, new release. So, but we still have that have to have that capability, and that's what those release branches do. So, what do you mean you're not running all the tests at every change list? <laughs> <laughs> so there's got to be another. I mean, I guess if it was me at a smaller company, I might say, okay, I'll just make my own Jenkins Hudson thing and and run just my own code in my own branch, so I know if I break something. I can point it to some particular change list. Like, does your accounting system help at all? Like, if you say, okay, I have one hour of, of compute time and you limit it that way, and so people have to scale back their tests, can you get, because it just seems like you're losing the, being able to lose the pinpoint, <coughs> losing the ability to pinpoint a particular change and say, this change broke things. Yeah. It just, it's like, it's one of my, uh, <laughs> one of the people on my team compares that ability to like crack. OK, but, you know, it is it's like crack. I mean, you get a hit of that and you just want it. Right. It's good stuff. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry, maybe that's the wrong analogy. But, you know, I it's, it's like they want they want to be able to have that ability. And people are really not happy that we're talking about taking it away. And I'm hoping I can leverage that into a little bit of motivation for teams to cut back on their resource consumption. Look, if you want to run fewer tests at every CL, I can do it. OK, but it has to be fewer and you have to work with me on it. And that's it. That, that is the first message that's been resonating with my uh, product area teams. When I go to them and I say, look, this is it. This is what we have. This is the growth curve. You put up the growth curve like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and 
you have to work with me. And, and yeah, that's going to be effective. And it may be effective to lower the coefficient just enough that we'll be able to do it for longer. But when I see quadratic, I know it's going to be an end eventually. Um, and it just has to do with this, how we're growing and scaling. So uh, I have two questions. The first question is um, you could probably cut down on the amount of time you're spending running tests if you took some sort of like uh, threshold, say like if somebody does a check-in and maybe two tests fail, then you say, all right, this is bad as long as they're not leaking tests. You don't run the rest of the tests. You just kind of kick it back to them. Yep. And then you can create a uh, You know, there's all kinds of strategies we're considering. Certainly, we've talked about different strategies like that. Um, one of the things we're trying to, to understand is how much complexity we're going to own, right? Uh, we don't want to own the system that's very complex because the more complex it is, the more trouble it's going to have for us to maintain it. So we're always trying to push ourselves, especially with a system like this. You really have to be but simple because if there's if it's really too complicated for people to understand and to work on, it'll be not right. So, so we've considered some solutions like that, and then we at the end of the day look at it and say, you know, maybe that's a little too complicated. We'd like to have something simpler. And again, a little bit of pushback on the teams may lower the coefficient enough that we'll be good for another couple of years. I don't, and also pressure on the VPs to say, hey, give us more machines. Actually, we're now getting big enough. Before this, we've just been piecemealing machines, you know, going and asking for some, and we get some, and and now with this growth curve, we have actually have to do six-month planning for the first time. You know, like most big teams around Google, they have to do long-range planning to say, here's what we're going to need next year and have the data center people build it out. And that's what we're starting to get to with this system is we, we've learned from some of the bigger teams that we have to do that. We have to go resource planning and we have to say, look, six months from now, we want to double the size of what we're doing. Where can we put it? And they can say, well, you're nuts, but if you could get the VP to approve, it might go here. You know, that kind of thing. And my second question is, so... You have uh, 3,000 people, in, let's say, in this office, and you've basically replicated it so that whatever test is going to be run when they check it into the sky um, gets run also on their local pretty much the same way. So why don't you just flip it and trust what their local did if their local is, is technically identical? The problem there has to do with the CL submission rate because it takes 20 minutes to test, and during 20 minutes, do you know how many CLs get submitted? A lot. Okay? And... We're taking a risk with that pre-submit result saying that nothing broke it in between the time when they started the pre-submit and the time when it finished. It's just in that 20 minutes, there might be you know several thousand CLs that got submitted, and any one of them could have broken their test or could have interacted poorly with their change. Um, so the answer is uh, we can't yet test fast enough to be able to do that because it, it, it requires us to keep up with the pace of submissions. Hmm? Yes. Could we... Could we Mm -hmm. You have a computer dependency graph from the pre submit. Yep. Which pull out every a set of CLs, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. it your curve yep. in the desired direction. There's that complexity thing I was talking about. Yes. We could possibly figure out from the dependency graph whether a CL that was submitted in the between could have potentially interfered with this one. And if it if there weren't any, then we could say, but I'm guessing with Yeah. That that could be another that could be another thing we we try, we try and tackle. I, I I hadn't occurred to me, but that's yeah, definitely true. We could figure that out. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you.